Hello and good evening. I'm really, I'm really happy to welcome Iñaki Canichero. Canichero. Oh, sorry. See, I'm, I said I'm bad with introductions. Um, I'm just nervous, yeah. Um, no, it's a, it's a funny coincidence. When uh, we were on the study abroad trip, uh, we were visiting the Venice Biennale, and, and, and visiting the Venice Biennale, the students know, we, it's really overwhelming. It's full of different pavilions, different architectures, different exhibitions, and you walk through these pavilions, and it's almost too much to take in. And then I, I went into one of the pavilions, and one of the national pavilions, and, and it had this amazingly beautiful exhibition, which was curated really well, and 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 also the exhibition setup itself was almost like a like a breath of fresh air in within the whole noise of this biennale and and it was my favorite pavilion and that was the spanish pavilion and then and then about 6 weeks later uh our two of our faculty members one of them um Jose Mayoral and and Jose Ramon they they actually met in a key on uh, at the at the Venice Biennale and, and made a contact and, and reached out to me and said, hey, you should meet this guy. We, we should have him over for a lecture. And I was like really happy that they could make the connection uh, and that we now have you here. This is really, really great and rewarding. And I think this is great that we are connected to the Biennale through our faculty, through our visits, and, and now through you. Um, active in both the academic field and a, pro and a professional practice, Iñaki Kanik Cero has been an associate professor of design at the School of Architecture at Polytechnic University of Madrid since 2000. A year after graduating, Canicero earned his first commission through a competition for the construction of a university building in Madrid, which was combined by his participation in the Venice Architecture Biennale of 2000. Canicero has won several competitions and completed many projects, including CEU University, Social Housing, a high school, the restoration of an Arab tower, a district attorney's office in Madrid City of Justice, a cultural multi-use center in a former slaughterhouse of Madrid, and the Pitch House. He's the co-founder of the architecture platform Symmetries relating Roman and contemporary procedures. His PhD dissertation focuses on Louis Kahn and Robert Venturi's discoveries in Rome regarding the perception of size in architecture. Canicero's work is published widely and internationally. Among many recognitions are Ragua's Secret, from Co Magazine number 359, Carni Venturi, Apr April 2010, A New Scale of Rome, 10 Theses a Corso, and edi Editorial Morena and Symmetries Manifesto in at, at symmetries.espana. Yes. Um, Iñaki Canicero received multiple awards, grants, and fellowships, among them the prestigious Rome Prize. And I think we hear more of that soon because I'm seeing a slide of Rome here. Uh, the Spanish Academy in Rome in 2007, the Design Vanguard Award from Architectural Record in 2011, the Selected Emerging Architecture Awards from Architectural Review in the UK in 2011, the Häuser Award in Germany, uh, the AIA New York Social Housing Award, and most recently the Golden Lion at the Venice Architecture Biennale for Best National Pavilion, which I didn't know when I saw the pavilion. That's how. But um, his contribution as curator of the Spanish Pavilion together with Carlos Quintans. Inetti Canicero work is exhibited internationally, most notably at the Venice Architecture Biennale, the RBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects Exhibition, International Emerging Architects in London, the International Exhibition Architecture Week in Prague, and the 2012 Emerging Future GA Gallery in Japan. In 2014, he founded Rika Studio together with his partner Ro Lorena Del Rio. And um, I want to give you a warm welcome to Inetti Canicero. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this presentation. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Can you guys hear me in the back? No. Oh. So. Should I? Now? Hello? Yes, I think better now. So. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's a big pleasure being here with you guys uh, tonight. Um, <coughs> so I I wanted to uh, start this presentation with this image of Rome, uh, a city where I think every architect should and, and designer should spend one year of his life. 
um, because uh, it's the opportunity to understand uh, the importance of time uh, as a material, something that is uh, very uh, critical from my point of view. So I had the opportunity to spend one year there as a fellow of the Spanish Academy, and I became interested in uh, validating contemporary strategies in the past. No? So things that for me uh, during these years have become important in, in my practice and in my teaching, things like flexibility, adaptability, reuse, that some of you might think that are like very trendy topics. It was important for me to, to read uh, this historical architecture and to see some of uh, these strategies in the past. No? So when we look at this image, uh, we are all fascinated no, by the juxtapositions of buildings from different periods and styles. But what made these buildings endure over time was not uh, the style of the buildings, but was mainly the capacity to adapt to the different necessities that society has demanded over the years. And of course, the good thing about being in Rome is that you read the whole history. You read 20 centuries no, of architecture there. So, and during these 20 centuries, you get a bigger perspective and you read moments of economic prosperity, but also moments of economic decline, no? Um, so in this famous uh, Piranesis engraving, the sublime condition of the Temple of Mars was achieved when ordinary people inhabited the ruins and the real scale of the capitals was revealed. The Temple of Saturn, originally designed to represent the House of God, became an ordinary bakery in medieval times. No? And this is, for me, something really fascinating. And if we look, these three capitals in the next slide are those, the one in the lower corner to the right. And this is what happened after Mussolini ordered the excavation of, of, the, of the forum, that all these uh, spaces inhabited by people became a park full of inanimated objects and a place for uh, tourists. No? So the inhabitation of the ruin made all the difference. This is one of my favorite spaces in Rome. I used to spend a lot of time uh, here uh, since when you are a fellow in Rome and you're an architect, basically your research is uh, not doing anything. It's just experiencing the city. No? So you can have a coffee, sit on a space like this and and looking at the different elements and speculate about the history you know, of, of things. And I remember I was fascinated by these columns because they were all different. You know? They had different styles, the capitals also. So I learned in the school that one should follow always an style. You know? But here, what was the reason? You know, that What made the architect choose all these different capitals? You know? And uh, it's interesting that here you realize that sometimes architecture becomes a problem of reusing found objects rather than uh, an, stilistic, an stilistic issue. No? This is the plan of the Diocletian Palace that was uh, designed uh, in the fifth century after Christ to be the house of the emperor. But uh, what happened after the fall of the Roman Empire was that this house that was designed to be the house of the emperor became the city of Split. And it's interesting that over the years, people started inhabiting with houses the different spaces that used to belong to the cast to the palace. No? And uh, so my current interest in flexibility emerged from understanding the importance of the uncertain future life of the buildings we design. So I'm sure that the people who were in charge of designing the Diocletian Palace, they never thought that they were designing the city of Split. And even today, you can see this juxtaposition of the uh, different geometries. So these are some of the ideas I learned from Rome, and I tried to apply uh, these ideas in my own context. And this is my context. Uh, the situation where I've had the chance to develop my practice changed radically after the crisis in 2008. And as you may know, probably many of you know this bull, uh, but this is a, a billboard that is used in Spain to advertise uh, this winery, important winery company. Um, people in Spain are so proud of this symbol. 
we uh, can see it in the landscape uh, in all different types of relationship with existing roads in the top of a mountain even some of our uh, most notorious uh, directors have shot the like the hottest moments of hottest scenes of the movie under under the bull and i think somehow we feel uh, very identified uh, very proud of this symbol mm, probably identified by the strength of the uh, animal no? and this is what happened in 2008 all the strength of the bull uh, became weakness no and the context where we've had the opportunity to build uh, more buildings than any other country in Europe changed, totally changed forever. No? And we have to start, uh, first First of all, what we did was uh, crying a lot and complain a lot. And then we decided that we have to continue doing architecture and finding uh, other strategies. No? And I want to show this uh, for two reasons. First of all, to, both to talk about this uh, economic constraint, but also to show what uh, what it is um, an, um, an a, a very interesting artistic action, which is by means of using a very simple barrel of lupine, you can subvert a symbol or of, of a country in this case, and totally transform it into something else. No? And I think architecture has to do uh, something with this. Uh, how can you, uh, by means of minimum uh, actions, have a big impact in our society? So the first house that I wanted to share today, it uh, was completed in the last years of the period of economic prosperity, and the house was designed considering two scenarios. The present, where two independent families would be inhabiting the house, and a future condition when the economic situation of one of the owners would allow the reconfiguration of the two houses to become as one single family one. The house has three levels, the basement uh, to solve the slope, the ground floor where all the living spaces are open to the landscape, and a second level where all the private rooms are located in a more introverted space, generating this cantilever that uh, allows the sun to heat the glass and to heat the interior during winter time, but during summer times, because the position of the sun is in a, in a higher angle, it never reaches uh, the glass. So the pitch house offer me an opportunity of studying how flexibility could be achieved by reorganizing the static elements of a house, such as servant spaces in the ground floor, all in that uh, black band that you see there and the storage areas in the second floor. So we realized that if we attach all these storage elements, we could create this thick wall that would be benefit from having more isolation, but also would allow us to transform the interiors and the partitions over time. Um, also in the ground floor, uh, besides that black band that you see facing north, the rest of the uh, enclosure are sliding doors that expand the interior of the house to the terrace and the, uh, the porch that you uh, were, so were seeing before in the, in the section. So it was a, a very interesting process and, and it was, we had to deal a lot with the different uh, necessities of the two families. Um, but at the end of the day, what happened is that when we asked the contractors for a budget, I, I promised uh, these clients that they were going to build it with the budget they have. Um, uh, what happened is that uh, these contractors, not, not these ones, but the ones that we were asking for a budget, they gave us uh, a money, that like twice the budget that we had to build the houses. No? So the clients wanted to kill me. And the solution I found was kind of scary. But uh, I met that guy, this guy here. His name is Anton Jacobini Pitch, a guy from Romania. Uh, I met him putting tiles on the ground, uh, working in really bad conditions. But I remember looking at him, and he was really meticulous. He seemed to be caring a lot about his work. So I realized that I have to 
we have to act as contractors in a way, you know? So maybe we could find somebody in charge who could know, uh, have a minimum knowledge of construction, maybe we could reduce the cost, no? So I asked uh, Anton if he could, uh, if he has worked before in Romania, and uh, he told me, yes, sir. And I asked him, Anton, but have you built uh, something bigger than, than putting tiles on the ground? He told me, yes, sir. Uh, but and, uh, Anton, have you worked with uh, concrete? Because I, I knew at that time that I wanted to use concrete uh, as a constraint. And he told me, yes, sir. And he was so confident, and I said, okay, let's go ahead, and let's start this adventure. And so we started the construction, and afterwards I realized that he didn't speak a word of Spanish. He would only say yes, sir, to everything. So it was kind of risky, but it was probably the most interesting experience of, uh, of my life, you know? Because I learned from the logic of the construction site and from the logic of these guys trying to solve everything with uh, the objects, the materials they found. No? So for instance, this day, they have to celebrate that the structure was completed, and uh, we wanted to do a barbecue to celebrate, and I was asking Anton, do you need, do you need a table, do you need uh, chairs, do you need, and he said, no sir, we have everything, and basically, they push down uh, the scaffolding, they use uh, this wheelbarrow to do a barbecue, the rod, uh, this guy, because was shorter than the rest, was sitting out on the top of one ceramic piece, so everything was solved on the side. And for me, this was a lesson, no? Because at the same time we were building the house, I was uh, concerned about designing a really cool facade, no? That would be published in all the magazines. Um, the two houses together had 30 meters, so it was a pretty long facade. And I remember doing all types of models. Models with circular windows, with triangular windows, tilted windows, everything. I had a hundred of them. And I I, uh, I couldn't decide no, what would be the best um, idea. And then, because Anton was just following the, the logic of the materials and the formwork we had, uh, he wouldn't listen to me and he would just continue uh, building the walls. And then one day I arrived and I saw uh, this, this is the second level, and, and then I realized that it didn't, it, it was kind of uh, unnecessary and, and absurd all the different models that, that I did because I was not considering the size. And the most powerful, the most powerful thing was the horizon line and how to, incor how to bring it uh, to the interior of the space. So basically, the way we finally decided uh, the facade was not doing anything, not doing a facade. So uh, at the end is the wall that was uh, built at the time, and then a roof, no? We decided to use concrete uh, as, an, as a constraint to explore uh, different ways to subvert the industrial condition of uh, this material uh, to define a domestic environment. No? We were interested in uh, using this uh, wooden formwork and also to break somehow the logic of gravity so by creating these impossible points, uh, we were mm, interested in making concrete being uh, floating as it didn't have uh, the weight that it really has. No? In the interior, the pillars, the steel pillars of the ground floor are hidden behind uh, the frame. So when you are in the living room and you're facing uh, the landscape, you have this sensation that, that you have a heavy thing that is floating above you. And because of the two houses were not that big, they might, it might look a, a big house or two big houses in the images, but actually when you visit it, uh, it's are not that big. Actually, this is one of the living rooms and it only has, it only have, uh, I think it's around 50, 50 square meters, which is not a big living room. Uh, the idea was instead of bringing different pieces of furniture, build one single piece that would solve different uh, problems no? and different necessities like um, this uh, bench uh, to be seated, the kitchen, or uh, the main access of one of the houses. No? We also incorporated two double height. I, all um, that I was interested 
uh, was how to make the space look bigger than it really was, no? So uh, when you create a double height, the perception of the space totally changes, no? Even when you create uh, a skylight and you allow the solid light of the sun to define the longest diagonal of the space, uh, magically the space uh, looks, I don't know why, but seems to be bigger, no? And I was very interested in these kind of actions. And once you make this decision, the, the bookshelf, for instance, that, that you design doesn't have to follow the logic of, of uh, human scale or the logic of functionality, no? It has to be a scale according to the space, no? And of course, every time that somebody uh, comes to the house and visits, uh, they always ask the same question, no? How do you get the books that are up there on the top, no? That's the main question. <coughs> but the answer is always the same, that everybody has books that are never gonna be read in your whole life, so that's the perfect place for, for these books, no? Um, <coughs> these are one of the rocks that existed in the site that we decided to use as part of the structure. And at night is really uh, magical in a way because since uh, we were minimizing the frames because they, uh, these frames were German fr uh, frames, really, really expensive. <laughs> and we, uh, so we could only uh, bring it to the uh, squares that you can see on the left. But the rest of the glazed facade, we uh, designed two very simple canals on, on the ground and on the, and on the ceiling. So basically it doesn't have frames. And at night it really disappears. It looks like you are in the, in the exterior, no? In this, you are somehow inhabi inhabiting the terrace, but you are only paying for the energy of 50 square meters. This is um, one of the rocks that I mentioned before. <coughs> and then what happened was um, an interesting lesson. Uh, this guy calls me and he was interested in renting the house to uh, do a commercial. This guy is the most famous uh, guy in Spain. He's not the president, he's not the king. He's the, the, he used to be the coach of Real Madrid soccer team. And he uh, has two, two was interested homes. in renting it to one fake is football, that it was one his is own my house. Real home. I mean, football I enjoy every second when I am at home with, uh, with my family, in my space, in my privacy. I also enjoy it very, very much. So. That's why I, I feel I'm, I'm a happy guy. Başarılı olmanın ilk kuralı evde mutlu olmaktır. If I coach a Turkish team one day, I know where my house will be. Simpas Geyeo. Okay, so <coughs> this guy, this guy lives or used to live uh, in Madrid in a house that cost 40 million euros, right? And the cost of these two houses were was only uh, around. 400,000, but it, it gave me a lot of hope uh, on the tools we have as designers, no? on making a space that is not that expensive, look more luxurious than it really is. No? By controlling the dimensions, the materials, the proportions, you can create something that looks uh, luxurious. No? And then this guy that <coughs> I've never seen the house, but, but must be super huge, uh, maybe he doesn't find no, this lu uh, luxurious condition, no? and, and this was an interesting lesson. And, and afterwards, uh, other uh, Real Madrid soccer players also uh, wanted to the house to represent uh, his type. No, this guy is famous for being a gigolo, not working much on the soccer field. Muy bien. Uh, que diga lo que he thought que this house would represent the, per the perfect space for him. No? So it's it's kind of funny these these things that happen, these unexpected things that happen mm, without knowing at the beginning. <coughs> the next project uh, was the first time that uh, somebody uh, called the office, saying that they wanted to give us the commission of doing the restoration of an Arab tower in Guadalajara, no? And we got really really excited because. Um, an Arab tower, probably from the 14th century. Uh, this must belong to a castle and, or, or a palace, and, and this palace must be amazing. We started speculating about the history of this palace. No? 
uh, we asked the clients, which actually was the Ministry of Culture, they uh, to give us uh, pictures or plans or tell us more about it, but they said, no, not yet, we will let you know. But since we couldn't wait, we, we started the design, imagining, uh, speculating about who uh, was inhabiting the tower. And so we imagined that there was a princess living in this tower, and probably the tower was a place where she would meet her lover, and it was probably attached to this amazing construction. And so we started thinking about it and how different strategies with which we could be uh, tackling this. And then the clients uh, call us and, and said, okay, finally we can come to visit uh, the site. And so we, we grab all, all the plans that we've done, all the images. We were so excited. And then when we arrived to the tower, they said, okay, here is the tower. No? <laughs> and then, so we look at it and, and we thought he was joking, but no, it was true. That was the tower. And we said, okay, so and what's, what's the program? And, and they say, uh, what do you mean, the program? Yeah, what do you want to put inside? And, and they said, no, no, uh, nothing, uh, nothing inside. There is, uh, we don't even have a door here. We just, basically, they wanted us to put the stones in the original position, no, to define the shape of this little tower. So um, we wanted to, uh, to leave the profession and start doing something else. But <coughs> finally we decided, okay, let's try to, to do something with this. Let's try to convince them at least to make it inhabitable, no? So it was, uh, as you can see, a, a three by three square plan. And what we decided is that with the budget we had, that it was only 90,000 um, euros to make it inhabitable and to recreate the history or the story that we have invented in the office. And because we still imagine the, this princess living inside of the tower, we couldn't just open a hole and allowing this princess to, to, to be uh, almost digging, no? to enter to the, to the space. So we decided to create somehow like a promenade or an access. So uh, we invented this bridge that would force the people uh, in a close proximity to, to the cliff. There is a cliff. So uh, people would need to experience on the one hand the, the risk of entering to this castle, uh, but at the same time uh, contemplating the landscape. So um, to, de to design this very simple bridge, because we didn't have much budget, we were inspired in the images we saw around, and we decided to use aluminum as a material that would uh, generate this very light object, as light as possible, because uh, by uh, connecting this uh, object, or this device, to the existing tower, we will reinforce by opposition the weight and the thickness of the walls uh, of this uh, tower. So this is the context, and that's the, uh, the access that this imaginary uh, princess would need to take to enter. Here is this uh, a beautiful uh, connection from my point of view because you define this dialogue between the old and the new and the lightness in somehow reinforcing the thickness of these walls that have been there for, for centuries. No? So we define a very simple ladder to access to the second level and instead of covering with an opaque roof, we use a, um, uh, I don't remember the word, but like a um, grid, uh, so the light would enter to the space, but we would still be able to access to this second level. So again, our imaginary princess could access to the top and say goodbye to, uh, to her lover. No? The next uh, project is a competition that, that, uh, that we want uh, to design this social housing uh, building in, in Vallecas, in Madrid, in, a, in an area where the city is growing. And the master plan that has been developed there is in the outskirts of, of Madrid, but uh, we thought it was uh, really horrible because basically 
the idea for the master plan is repeating this uh, perimeter block a thousand of times. And basically they were copying uh, the ones that Cerda uh, designed for Barcelona, which were designed in a very different uh, scale. And with the idea of using these corners to create public uh, spaces so people would be gathering and talking and meeting in the city. But here, because of the scale and because of the lack of density, this form and this shape is doesn't make much sense. Uh, so the, the way it works in this competition is that they launch, each perimeter block is divided in four L-shaped buildings. So we, the, the competition we won was this corner here, which is tricky because you don't know what the other competitors are going to be doing. So it's, it's kind of like a defining a, a, a Frankenstein, no? And this is the neighborhood because this is social housing People don't care much about the design. They think that since these houses have to be very cheap, the layout is, it has these very uh, big constraints regarding the size. So the materials, they always use brick because they think it's the uh, cheapest material. They always use the same window. So people don't have a feeling of uh, owning a property and, and, and they don't feel proud of it. No? So we thought that somehow we need to fight against that repetitive form and that repetitive mat material. So we study carefully the regulations. No? The regulations force us to follow that uh, chamfer, 45 degrees chamfer in the corner, and then to in case that we want to build a penthouse to recess um, three meters, or follow that 45 degrees angle virtual line. So what we did was basically building the maximum volume that we could build and then extract and carve out this void. Uh, so people, instead of just owning an apartment in the building, they would also share all these uh, spaces that were creating uh, these voids. So by doing so, that was the, the final shape that was generated. That was looking at the possibility of having double height penthouses in the upper floors connecting the interior of uh, the courtyard to the exterior or creating places up here to see the sunset of Madrid. <coughs> and this is uh, the final uh, form that was uh, generated. But as I was saying, this was already in the process where the crisis was hitting uh, the, economic the, the economy in Spain. And so the construction work stopped for three years. And then when we restarted, uh, we saw that our neighbors built this. No? It was a similar shape than the one that we were designing. And when, uh, when we saw it, we didn't know very well how could we find a connection. No? Mm, with this color that, let's say, in a gentle way that we were not very attached to it. So uh, how do we manage this uh, situation, no? And then we realized that the best way to um, uh, connect to this existing construction was assuming that this color should be part of our construction. So by using it and highlighting the common spaces, we would define this interesting dialogue with the other construction on the top. So we decided to use it even though we didn't like it at first, no? And now this line represents all these uh, spaces where people can gather and, and the, they have this feeling of owning something besides uh, their own house. And so some of these operations were in interested in monumentalizing the social housing. Uh, it's not for us, any it shouldn't be anymore this repetitive window, but learning from the experience of the past, like in this case, in the Church of uh, Jesu in Naples, which is an amazing church because of the scale and the monumentality, and how it's achieved by just oversizing the dimension of uh, the windows. No, so we thought that maybe by creating these double height uh, spaces in the facade, we were um, playing with the scale of the uh, of the building and monumentalize in a way and create this. Uh, form in this neighborhood that people would be 
much more attracted and they will have a feeling and they will be proud of owning uh, a house in, in here. No? The, <coughs> the windows, instead of having this, again, this repetitive window, we decided to fragment it in a smaller ones and each window is moving according to the things that we see uh, in the area. Sometimes it's the lighting, sometimes it's the, are the trees that exist in front of it. No? Another, ex <coughs> sorry, <coughs> another exploration into reusing an existing building was this international competition, the Hangar 16, Matadero Madrid, which gave us the opportunity to investigate on movement as an interesting mechanism to achieve flexibility. The international competition was launched with the intention of reusing this hangar to accommodate the permanent art collection of ARCO which is a very important art fair that happens in Madrid every year. The interior was not uh, very interesting, as you can see here, but the proportions of the space were uh, incredible. No? So I, I had the feeling that we would be designing uh, in a church or even in a cathedral, no? because the proportions were similar. <coughs> so the proposal for the competition was very simple. Basically, we designed uh, a set of uh, monumental doors that will rotate uh, finding different positions and according to this position these double heights, these uh, spaces, sorry, would be uh, used in very different ways uh, they, at first they want this building to be an exhibition of art but afterwards they decided to incorporate other uses like possible concerts um, lectures even a fashion walk, they wanted to celebrate it inside of the building. So we won the competition and it was already 2008. Uh, we had bad experiences in other competitions that stopped because of the crisis and we wanted to run. So we started doing models and drawings and putting some pressure on the clients so we would start the construction, but we didn't hear anything from them. And after two months, we thought that we were going to lose uh, this opportunity again, but since we learned the lesson that mm, we have to deal with it and we have to learn from it and, and we have to be positive about it, we decided to, um, to do this uh, video. Oh, sorry, we'll have to see again uh, the doors moving. So it's a video where we uh, were interested in putting this table, all the all the models, all the mock-ups, all the stuff that was around in order to to solve uh, the program. No? The project was very simple. Basically, we were focused on one of these doors, but we were testing different materials, different textures. And the main idea was that each of these double height spaces had two levels of doors. The, the ones in the ground floor would be connected uh, or would be connecting or dividing the spaces. And the ones on the second floor would be acting as shutters in order to, to uh, protect the interior from the, from the light. <coughs> it was somehow a way to say goodbye and, and, and to start thinking about the next project, but then what happened is that one of the uh, promoters saw the video and, and he liked it so much, so he asked us, can you guys do it for half of the budget you have? And we said, of course, uh, we are experts. And so basically it was, it was an interesting process of uh, removing everything that was not important, no? even those things that you consider really relevant in design, but they had to go away. And at the end, we figured out that it could be kind of fun to say, okay, well, if we only have one element and we solve everything with that element. No? So we, we realized that by uh, focusing in the doors, no? these doors that would be uh, these uh, panels here connected by hinges to the other panel, 
And the first one has a, a point of rotation in the, in the uh, midpoint, and the other one is, is not attached at all to the ground. So by these very simple two movements, we could achieve all types of variations, and we thought that was enough. Uh, that was going to be the only material that uh, was going to solve this, uh, the whole uh, construction. This is the space as it was at the beginning of the construction. The walls were like this. And <coughs> we realized that we couldn't add another material, uh, but we could, uh, well, this is the facade. It's a facade, a Neomudejar facade that is typical in Madrid from the beginning of the 20th century. So we thought, well, if we remove the layer of plaster here, we could uh, reveal in the interior the construction, the construction techniques of the beginning of the century and showing something that was meant to be hidden, no? Somehow the backside of that uh, beautiful uh, Neomudejar facade, no? So um, this is the main uh, space, uh, what it happened after uh, putting all the doors in their positions and playing with it. Sometimes the space is uh, connected to the rest of the areas. Sometimes it reveals the, w the old wall, the history of the building, but sometimes you can enclose this space as an hermetic box to put all the attention to um, the, ex the exhibited uh, piece. No? People can play with uh, these uh, doors, so it becomes uh, like an animated uh, landscape. Um, so the constraint of always using the two steel panels connected by hinges that was taken as a premise in some cases produced uh, unexpected geometries and unconventional solutions as in this case because the existing uh, holes and windows were like this. We basically cut uh, the same steel frame structure and uh, in the case of the upper windows having the hinge in the center, it generates this floating uh, perception. And here, by using the thickness of the wall and by having this uh, line of rotation, we can create seats where people can take a rest uh, in between the exhibitions. Or for instance, in the access to the bathrooms, to create some privacy, we folded one of the doors, always connected by hinges, or inside of the bathroom, instead of uh, using a conventional layout, we decided to attach all the sinks to uh, the existing windows, and using again the same shutters, we we didn't want this uh, conventional situation where you are washing your hands and you are looking at yourself in the mirror. We thought it was much more interesting to be looking at the landscape. There is a nice garden outside, but the clients didn't like it, so we found this solution in between. So by hiding the mirror outside, we could open it. So we will have half of the landscape and half of yourself, looking at yourself. In the main access, uh, <coughs> I, I always found really interesting the, the churches in, in, in Rome that you access through a, through a small box of wood where you feel the compression and then you finally open the, the door and you experience the, the monumentality of the space. No? So in this case, instead of just having a conventional door to enter to this double height, by starting a different mechanism of rotation, we uh, transform one of the other doors into a canopy. So people, to enter to the space, they have to feel the compression of the access, and afterwards they, uh, they experience the double height. And here are some images of the space uh, under use. Uh, if you have the chance to go to Madrid, please go because there is always something going on. Uh, it has changed the neighborhood. There, is, there are always uh, movies, uh, video art, uh, all types of installations. Sometimes they celebrate workshops, uh, lectures, dinners, uh, or big concerts. You know? and, and it's really uh, amazing you know, that when that you realize that by this very mm, minimum Yesters, you allowed all these possible events to happen in the same space. No? Um, the next project was a commission of a 
of somebody who who was in love with uh, the pizza house. It, it's a good friend of mine, and he liked the house so much. And he said, Iñaki, uh, I want you to design exactly the same pitch house, but in my village. And I said, okay, Javier, but uh, I mean, we can change it and we can adapt it to your necessities mm, because you know this house belongs to two families. And then uh, he said, no, 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 I want exactly the same. And he said, okay, so let, let's go to visit the site. No? And so we go to the site, to the, la to the land he owns, and that was, it was an, an amazing landscape, no? Um, so we went to, to talk to the people, to the architect in charge of the regulations, and when we asked him that we were interested in building there the pitch house, he said that the regulations only allow, allow you to build a 25 square meter house, which is like five by five, uh, 250 square feet. No? So uh, we were really disappointed, no? But since this guy is very optimistic, he said, okay, let's make it, uh, let the pitch house smaller, no? And, and of course he didn't know very well what he was talking about, no? And, but we said, okay, let's, let's try to do something. And we came across this idea. We asked him, what's your favorite uh, space of the pitch house? And he said that was this one, no? Because it's actually five between this pillar meters and it's another five meters in this direction so five by five and we thought okay we cannot shrink the pitch house but we can build a piece of it right uh, using the same materials the same square frame wooden frame the glazed facade so let's try to do that no so if we look at the plan of the pitch house as the house that the regulations would allow us to build in his site no but then after the experience of the pitch house, we were, we became interested in movement, no? In, in how, uh, if you study some precedents, you realize the, the inventions that some architects have been uh, developing, no? Like in this case, this uh, French architect, no? By uh, rotating that partition, create different organization of the house. But also if we go to the past and we realize like these windmills that by uh, rotating the, the construction, they were uh, using the energy of the wind. And sometimes you discover interesting inventions like this rotating uh, revolving table to read several books at the same time, or this uh, fascinating rotating defense, uh, defense tower. So uh, you can shoot the canyons. So as it rotates, uh, you have time to charge again the canyon and shoot a bullet again. So it's, it's kind of um, uh, like a new perspective in how you can use movement in architecture in order to solve a very mm, uh, particular, uh, a very precise problem. No? So <coughs> we did a thousand of these uh, schemes studying how a square of five by five could be uh, redefined by moving partitions, no? And at the end, we uh, came across this solution that uh, was dealing with the regulations. It was really tough to build in 25 uh, square meters, no? But we realized that by building a double enclosure, building this piece in a shop and bringing it to the site, so this double enclosure could be open when uh, my friend arrives to the house. And when it's uh, 25 square meters, it becomes 50 square meters. No? Maybe you will understand it better in the image. So this is what happens. He's going to use the house only in the weekends. So on Friday, he arrives. He rotates this secondary enclosure. And then exactly the same is that indoor that we were looking at the pitch house, he slides it, and the other one in the other direction. So what we generate by doing this is a central square that it becomes a living room, an empty space, similar to the one at the pitch house, five by five. And then he has these secondary spaces to create two uh, 
bedroom, the small bedroom. One bathroom that doesn't have to be a super small and shrink bathroom, at least. I mean, the, the shower is super big, actually. And a kitchen. Only, he's gonna be using this second house only during the weekends. When on Sundays, when he returns to the city, uh, he slides again the, uh, these frames to the original position, and then he encloses the secondary, uh, this secondary uh, enclosure. So the house remains as an hermetic uh, black box uh, in the landscape. And the amount of possibilities by only rotating one of these units is incredible. No? So we were really fascinated with it. Um, really quick, this is a project that was very unexpected because uh, the client it was, um, was from China. And uh, fr uh, first of all, we thought it was a joke because he said that he wanted us to design a luxurious resort in this uh, natural national park in Alati, in the center of China, close to Mongolia, in a place that when we visit was uh, incredible because of the geometry that you can see from the airplane. You always see these lines because th they use this, they, they plant these trees that grow really, really fast. No? So the area is full of these uh, linear paths. And basically uh, the, the commission was studying a public building with uh, library, restaurants, uh, spas, like a really complex program, and then around 60 uh, luxurious villas. No? And uh, the site plan they gave us was really, really undefined. No? But we have to be very respectful to this national forest. So it was, we, we were really lost because we said, okay, where are the constraints? We always need these constraints, these budget cuts, and here we didn't have limits with the with the budget. With the so, um, what we did was uh, well. First of all, design um, like one of the problems was how to build something inside of this beautiful national park. We didn't want at all uh, the scale of a of a house or or to rebuild a conventional building inside of this space. So we thought of that instead of building a building, we should do more like a path or a piece of infrastructure where the program would be uh, inside of this uh, uh, linear circulation. So this is the public building here. Uh, all these angles are uh, facing one of the most interesting views of the site. And then these secondary, these villas, a total of 40 villas, that uh, we uh, realized that the strategy have to be dealing with with error. Since we were not gonna be there measuring the trees, we were not gonna be there uh, taking dimensions and it was impossible to find the site plan, we decided to, uh, uh, to design a strategy. And the strategy was stacking these bands and uh, studying the different types of uh, spaces that we would achieve also by uh, atomizing and dividing the conventional wall, we were breaking the scale of the house, so we wouldn't be building a house inside of the forest. This is more or less the idea that, that we had in mind. So the limits of the house are blurred in a way. We don't know very well if the house ends with this bookshelf or in that wall over there or in this canopy. No? So basically we gave them the strategies and then people there uh, local people would be able to move uh, uh, a wall to one side or the other if they could find a tree or a, or, or a stone 
or, or a rock or anything, no? So we tested all these different villas. Um, <coughs> for instance, this is one of the villa that we call the spiral villa. Basically, these four stack uh, walls are defining the different uh, elements that they were asking, the swimming pool, the living room, uh, and the main bedroom. So this is all this following the logic of the spiral, but also we have the, the straight, the, the street villa, sorry, which is defining basically this cascade uh, arrangements of the bands. And the public building, which uh, tries to be more like a trellis, like a path that people would be uh, taking and they would suddenly find the program uh, not defined in one particular shape, but more connected to all the different spaces. Okay, and this is the last project that I'm gonna show today, which is the, the commission of, of uh, curating and designing the Spanish pavilion uh, that Mark was mentioning before. And it came, um, it came out uh, Alejandro Aravena was was asking all the all the curators to share what uh, they think has been a major issue that has affected architecture in in their own countries. No? So the idea for Alejandro Aravena was that if all the national pavilions share a problem that architecture has been dealing with after this uh, after visiting all these countries. Uh, we could have a better idea of things that might happen in our own country in the future. No? In our case, it was very obvious that we have to show uh, how the, cri the crisis, the economic crisis, uh, hit the, the our context. And many of the constructions that were, uh, many of the buildings that were under construction remained unfinished for two reasons, uh, mainly because uh, or basically for one main reason, which was the, the lack of consideration of what was going to happen in the future. No? These buildings might be designed to be an, uh, an airport, but then we realized that we didn't need anymore an airport. No? So that building, instead of being reused for something else, because of the structure that was generated was not easily adapted to something else, has remained and finish, no? and we have, it's incredible, all over the Spanish territory we have so many buildings that have uh, remained incomplete. No? So we thought that the main topic that we should uh, exhibit it should be uh, title and finish, and, but we didn't want to show a negative uh, perspective. No? We also wanted to show how uh, these um, photographers have been reporting this situation, like in this case, Cadelas Verdes showing like a, like a natural daily thing that would happen in a domestic space, like this woman having a coffee, reading a book. Uh, mm, like she doesn't know that the construction is unfinished, no? Um, like the situation is really terrible, no? Because people really need the space to live, but nobody has thought about how to complete these constructions. So. On the one hand, we thought it could be interesting to bring this irony, these uh, different ways to report the situation, but at the same time, uh, by looking at these images and these photographs, we realized that it was interesting to put all the attention on the process that uh, an unfinished construction uh, reveals. No? So besides reporting this negative aspect, with the exhibition unfinished, we try to bring attention to the process rather than to the result. Showing incomplete architectures that have the beauty of something that is not yet there, that is still capable to adapt to different circumstances. No? So um, we selected the cheapest steel profile on the market that is often used to build partitions as a constraint to build the whole exhibition. So it was somehow uh, after our experience at the slaughterhouse, at the slaughterhouse, we thought, okay, let's do the same. Let's, since we don't have uh, much money to 
to build the expedition, let's decide this material and let's solve everything with this uh, steel profile. This is the space of the Spanish pavilion. If you guys have been uh, at the Biennale, this is the central space. We were interested by those uh, steel profiles that probably a former a curator has been uh, probably used to hang some something, an art piece probably from the top. And this is the exterior that somehow it's uh, very hermetic, very neutral, not talking too much about what is happening in the inside. No? So the main operation uh, on this central space was uh, using these profiles to create a series of trusses that would be hanging from, the, from that uh, cross that you saw before. These trusses would be exhibiting seven series of photographers who have been reporting these unfinished constructions. We have Cadelas Verdes, which is the one that you saw before, but we have another collectives of people like uh, Nación Rotonda, which means uh, roundabout nation, nation, who have been reporting these useless uh, spaces uh, that are generated when do you do a roundabout, like this circle that is always a space for doing nothing. So, and, and this structure should be hanging and with a very simple motor, we were interested in creating different scenarios. No? In the outside, because, because of the image that you saw before, uh, the, the facade didn't uh, convey too much about what was happening in the inside. Uh, we thought that we had to reinforce the scale of it, but we were also interested, because of the weather in Venice, to, uh, to use this exterior pavement and to create a shape so we repeat somehow the same movement in a bigger dimension than at the slaughterhouse to create this canopy, no? And, <coughs> and, and this is the final exhibition. So uh, we had this idea, uh, as, as Mark probably knows very well, uh, when you go to the Venice Biennale, some people go one day, and in one day you have to visit all the pavilions, no? So you're really exhausted. So we were aware that people might come to this pavilion for a minute to say, okay, let's see the Spanish pavilion. Okay, oh, it's cool, or oh, it doesn't, I don't like it, and then they leave. Or maybe some people would come and spend some time there, uh, I don't know, taking notes or studying no, where we were exhibiting. So we thought that in order to respond to these first people that would be interesting, to see the pavilion in, in, in 10 seconds. Uh, if we were capable to arrange all these pictures uh, in this uh, perspective, so uh, people could arrive to the main access, look at this and, 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 and leave and say that they have seen the Spanish pavilion. No? Uh, but of course, if people wanted to, to uh, continue the exhibition, they could spend hours because we have like different levels of um, information. This central space, we knew since the beginning that should be uh, the place where we report these unfinished constructions. But at the same time, we hate these uh, exhibitions that are static. So it's only people arriving there, looking at the exhibited piece, and then they leave. So by using this very simple motor and lifting the whole structure, the space the empty space became an informal uh, auditorium where we've had several events since the opening and we could discuss uh, this unfinished architecture and what to do with it. At the same time, on the sides, we uh, used the steel profile, uh, in this case, to build these, tab these uh, tables, these long tables, and to exhibit it what we found as 55 uh, interesting projects that would bring solutions to these unfinished constructions. We open, we, we launched a competition, an open call, and we received more than 300 projects, and we selected 55 that were, uh, from, my, from our point of view, uh, responsible uh, in considering what already exists, what already has been built, and adding the minimum pieces to, uh, to reactivate, to reuse, uh, these constructions that have been uh, abandoned over years. 
And I think these are some of the final slides. Uh, we were rearranging this profile. Uh, we saw the trusses, we saw the tables, and these smaller rooms, in order to, to reinforce the, the vertical proportion of it, we create these more intimate uh, spaces so we could exhibit the works also inside of this uh, virtual room or outside. No? And this is the a video uh, for those of you who are not planning to go there that might give you a better sense of the final result. So somehow, with, with the way we we arrange the, the pictures and the drawings, uh, we were defending this idea that architecture doesn't end when we submit uh, a final design, and we are not owners of that design. In that construction. Uh, eventually in the future, another architect might intervene, might transform into something else and might change it. No? The information for those who want to spend hours, they could study each of the projects. from abroad, from people uh, that could give us uh, an independent perspective of how they see Spanish architecture, how they understand this unfinished uh, condition, uh, this idea of flexibility. I don't know where the second microphone went, which we would need for the, oh, over there, can you come? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I think this was a really beautiful lecture. I wonder if there's any questions in the audience, and I might, no, there we are. <laughs> any questions? Hi. Uh, could you talk about maybe scalelessness? Because some of the projects, like the the housing, has a large L, but that had to influence the weekend house tectonically, right? The fact that it opens and closes. So maybe the the way you work 
with different scales that a, a door can open like that or a whole corner of a building can open like that and then it becomes faceted in the city block maybe there's something about that thanks oh, thank you I think I think that's a, a very interesting question for me <coughs> the the topic of scale in architecture is one of the most uh, difficult and important uh, um, task no, that one has to respond. Um, I, I've been trying to, to talk about it in the different projects. Uh, so for instance, in the, in the project in, in China, in Alati, uh, this idea of, of breaking the conventional scale of the, of the house uh, so we could uh, divide no, the wall in a smaller walls that wouldn't make people perceive a house, but more a juxtaposition of walls that would might, that might belong to the landscape in a way has to do with that dissolution or that um, intention of uh, blurring the scale. Uh, in the case of the social housing, it's very different. We were trying to to monumentalize the uh, the building. We didn't want to recognize the people, the real dimension of the windows, because we have we have that solution in the rest of the blocks around our side. No, in this case, by playing with the with the different dimensions and and, and playing with the confusion, people, when they look at that double height, the green double height that I was showing, uh, they would be looking at it in a similar way than, or at least that was my intention. That when you look at the the Church of El Yesu in, Na in Naples, no, where you see a huge, monumental main window, no. So, and these are all uh, effects that you're that, that that I'm interested in in achieve by uh, by dealing with with size and and with the idea of revealing sometimes uh, the human figure uh, of the inhabitants in the architecture, or sometimes by hiding that human figure and make architecture look as something else, no? So, but it's a really interesting <laughs> topic, no? In the, case, in the case, for instance, of the revolutionary house, the house becomes uh, an hermetic box that could be perceived as a piece of art designed by Donald Jack, uh, I, I wish, no? Uh, but, uh, but when you open it, you recognize the, the, the dimension, no, of, of all the objects of the house. You said at the beginning that you're touching at, at, at topics that are that are kind of hip or, uh -huh. or in discussion right now. And I think reuse was one of the terms you used. And and when I look at uh, how you approach a lot of the projects and how the, a lot of the projects turn out, especially with there are other things like moving moving parts of architecture or moving architecture. I think a lot of your projects, and I also found this with the with the lecture because you use the movies a lot actually deal with time and the passing of time. And I was wondering if you can speak to your stance about the past, because you're showing a lot of a lot of buildings that, that are historical, especially in the in the in the exhibition. And then also about the future and how you feel architecture will change or how the use of architecture changes through time. Mm -hmm. Especially when you look out to the future. I think that's mm -hmm. quite interesting in your work. It's yeah. a maybe <laughs> more an observation than a question uh -huh. of I, I, it's funny because I'm much more interested in the past than in the future, no? And but here in in in, uh, in my experience in the American uh, academia, uh, I can see that people are much more interested to to design what is going to happen in a hundred years from now, no? But the only way for me to 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 test if this is relevant or not is look at the past, no? Uh, so when we talk about sustainability, you know, and we say that mm, we create sustainable buildings just by putting plants on it, no, or when we think about uh, reuse because it has become like a trendy, I think we have to be looking at the architecture of the past, no, and and to see how things have been behaving over the years, no. Uh, some years ago, with with some other colleagues, we decided to to create this platform, no, that we named Symmetries. And we were interested in looking at cities with uh, Roman tradition, bringing uh, students from Madrid. Uh, I was teaching at that time in Madrid, and people from from that city. We did it in Rome, in a Split, in Lisbon, and study and work on a on a site where we could 
uh, recognize some Roman ruins or Roman constructions and add a layer on the top of that. And, and it was really interesting to see how, for instance, at the Marcello Theater in Rome, uh, how in the, I don't know, in the 12th century, people decided to build houses on the top of, a, of an amphitheater, no? Which is really brave, no? And really, and uh, if we do that now, uh, I mean, Kujas would do it, no? Ren Kujas. Uh, so I think it's, it's uh, for me, it's fascinating, no? Because otherwise, architecture becomes um, only a speculative uh, process, and there is no no way to to agree or disagree, you know. Um, so I, I need to find examples in the past and to see how that has been behaving over the years, no? to see if it was as successful or not. No? For instance, the Diocletian Palace for me is probably probably one of the most successful buildings, no, because. It became a city, you know, and you visit today split, and and you recognize you still can see the rooms of the palace, no, that have become plazas. Um, so I I think it's a fascinating uh, topic, no, to to think about. I mean, any other questions? So I was wondering if you could talk about um, how it seems like in modern building systems you have such a specialization of materials for specific purposes, and that um, seems to differ from your approach where a lot of times you're using a single material like the steel profile. Do you think there's something inherent about design goals that is just ultimately different from um, other functional goals perhaps that makes the strategy of using a single material much more? Um, feasible. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood the question. So, you are. Uh, can you rephrase it? Um, I guess my question is: is it just seems like your strategy of using mm -hmm. a single material, often under the constraints of a, of a budget, yep. um, or other not um, always, right? Yeah, not always, other mm -hmm. other constraints. That seems to be very different from, let's say, compared to. Um, the, the way may, maybe m a lot of modern building systems work where, mm -hmm. uh, let's take a wall system, for example, mm -hmm. every layer is so specific mm -hmm. to a single specialized material, whereas um, your, your strategy seems to be different. Is there something inherent about the design strategies that makes that possible or even advisable, whereas um, in other systems they may not be mm -hmm. suitable? Well, it's... Uh, uh, I've been showing some examples no, of buildings that we've been, uh, where we've been, where we have been interested in challenging, no, the, in in forcing ourselves to work with these constraints. I really believe in constraints as a way to, to, uh, to discover an, an unexpected uh, solution. No, otherwise we all have our own agenda, and we all have images and ideas that we like, and if we start designing without uh, constraints, uh, you discover uh, that certain forms, certain organizations emerge on the drafting table. No? So in, in these examples, in these cases, the, um, the constraint of the material emerge as a consequence of analyzing the program, the budget, the local materials or not, uh, the difficulties that we are that we might have in the process. So these th these are very particular examples that respond to very particular, very different cases. No, uh, in the case of the pitch house, for instance, it was a very subjective decision because I love concrete. No, and they said, okay, let's try to do everything with concrete. No, uh, the, the the ground floor is not concrete; it's uh, white stone. And then, but for me, it's been interesting to an interesting way to explore uh, the dialogue of the materials no? and the different expressions that a material can, can achieve. No? But, uh, I mean, I understand that that's not uh, like the only path, no? and I understand that when you design 
an office building and when you have to deal with other things, you might need to, to use more materials or more layers, no? But I, I just think that it's always interesting to, to rethink the solution that, that you're using, no? Uh, there might be probably uh, sandwich panels in the market that behave perfectly, no? Uh, that are tested, that are certified. For me, it's much more, much more interested, interesting to, to test other solutions that might not be that conventional, no? That's why every time that I have the opportunity to, to, to test a new material or a new way to, ne not necessarily a new material, but an old material um, used in a different way, I, I try to do it. No? Maybe is there another question? Oh. Thank you. For that house that the box that opens up, when it opens up, uh, is there something that covers the interior or is it open to, no, there yeah, is, yeah, okay. You're, so you're right. Yeah, <coughs> yeah th that's a very interesting question because that's the tricky part. So uh, in the central space, there is a slab so the, the steel enclosure slides and opens in a different level, right? So the whole house is covered and is protected from, from, the, uh, from the wind or from the rain. No? Uh, I haven't shown uh, um, the technical details, but the main difficulty is when you slide the exterior, then the hinge have to uh, uh, move down that step so you have uh, all the like the ceiling in the same level, no? So that's the tricky part. That that part and uh, the toilet that needs to be uh, in the closest position to the hinge, right? So once you move it so by using a flexible pipe, you can uh, you can also uh, rotate the toilet. No? So it's interesting, no? Because at the end of the what makes possible uh, this house is the toilet, is solving the toilet and solving that issue that you pointed out. Now I'm curious to see more images of that project oh actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not built yet. We're working on oh it. So okay. yeah, yeah. Right. Um that this was it. Um thank you very much again thank you. for coming. Thank you. You know, because of the, all the technical.